welcome to Bible study number five, How Do I Receive the Gospel? The Most Important Promise. And we're thankful that you have taken the time to look at this. Let's go ahead and open in prayer. Lord, we pray that you would uh, use this study in a great way in the lives of those that watch it. We commit it to you. We pray that you'd use your word. Uh, we thank you for the clarity of your gospel. And we know that you um, use your word and that your uh, gospel is the power of God into salvation to everyone that believes. So we pray for your blessing on this Bible study now. And we pray you'd help me as I teach it. pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. So we rejoice that we've been able to help you study the Bible through the materials you've already completed. And we're glad to be able to continue helping you with this fifth study. The most important promise, namely salvation to those who receive God's most important provision, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died, shed his blood, and rose again to pay the full penalty for sin. Christ's work on the cross is sufficient to take care of the most important penalty, God's curse and his eternal judgment in the lake of fire, based on the most important problem, your sin, which separates you from God. So to review, in study number one, we learned about the Bible, the most important book. The Bible is inspired. It's God's perfect, error-free word. We also learned that God has perfectly preserved the Bible, so that when we read our English Bible, we are reading the pure and uncorrupted word of God, preserved intact for us today, translated accurately from the Greek and Hebrew text. We also examined some of the many proofs that God inspired and preserved his word in study number one. And then in study number two, we examined characteristics of God himself, God who is the most important being. We learned many of his attributes, the significance of the three central words for him in the Old Testament, Jehovah, Elohim, and Adonai. And we discovered that God has eternally existed in three distinct and eternal persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Then in study number three, we studied the Ten Commandments, as well as a few of the other commandments in the Bible, obtaining a sampling of the standard that mankind will face in the day of judgment. We learned that God commands us to live by every single one of the 791,328 words in the Bible, and His law promises blessing and eternal life for sinless obedience. However, God's curse and eternity in the lake of fire is the penalty for any and every disobedience to his word. This left us in serious trouble since all mankind sinned in Adam, is born with a corrupt and sinful nature, and commits countless sins. We are therefore worthy of eternal damnation, and in fact, until our sins are taken care of, we cannot truly please God at all. And all whom God does not view as sinless and perfect are under his wrath and are already condemned. Furthermore, people's attempts to escape the punishment of God's law by ignoring it, by denying their total depravity, by trying to be religious, by attempting to reform their lives, all those attempts totally fail. However, in Bible study number four, we learned that God has provided salvation for sinners through the redemptive work of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus, who was always fully God, became fully man and entered the world to deliver us from our sins. We found out that Jesus, whose name means Jehovah the Savior, was the Christ, the one who would come to save and rule the world. He is the Lord, the absolute master and sovereign, and the Savior, delivering his people from the penalty, from the power, and from the presence of sin. He is also the only mediator who can bring us to the Father. We learned of his mediatorial actions as prophet, revealing the will of God and speaking the word of God, priest, reconciling his people to God on the basis of the sacrifice of himself and effectually interceding for them before the Father, and king, ruling the saints and the church now, and upon his return, ruling the world. This great person came into the world to die for our sins. His death was a sacrificial payment to the Father. On the cross, he performed the work of a substitute and endured the judgment of God in our place. Thus, by taking our penalty, we might receive his righteousness. His blood was a propitiation because it forever appeased or satisfied God's wrath against the redeemed, and it was fully complete 
for his death is absolutely sufficient to save. Having died this infinitely valuable death, the Lord Jesus was buried, and then he rose again on the third day, proving that he was indeed the Messiah and manifesting the Father's satisfaction with his sacrifice. Christ then ascended to the right hand of the Father. He will soon return again to judge and to rule the world. We found out that this gospel was predicted in the Old Testament and that the Son of God's saving work brings his people adoption, for they become the children of God, justification, having Christ's righteousness credited to them, so that they are counted perfectly obedient and holy for Jesus' sake, reconciliation, for they recover fellowship and peace with God, sanctification, as they are set apart as God's own and led into the paths of holiness, and glorification, everlasting honor and blessing in God's presence. God's people receive all these blessings on account of their standing in Christ. This left us with a question, how do I personally receive the benefits of the gospel? How can you individually pass from spiritual death to spiritual life, enter God's family, and be found in Christ and so receive eternal salvation? That is the subject of this current study, study number five, God's most important promise. So looking at, uh, we're going to be looking here then at receiving the gospel with some expressions in scripture for receiving the benefit of what Christ did on the cross. Now in Mark 1, verses 14 and 15, the Bible says, the time that Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent ye and believe the gospel. So when the Lord Jesus preached the gospel, he called on those listening to him to repent and to believe. The apostles also preached repentance and faith. For example, the apostle Paul testified in Acts 20 and verse 21, it says that he was testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. These two words, repentance and belief or faith, summarize the means through which sinners personally appropriate the gospel, and we will examine them in more detail as this study goes on. Other biblical terms for receiving the gospel include conversion. So, for example, in Acts 3 and verse 19, the Bible says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So we have conversion. We also can say that we receive Christ. John 1.12 says, As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And we also have the term coming to Christ. In John 6 and verse 37, the Bible says, Christ says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. So all these terms, coming to Christ, receiving Christ, conversion, repentance, and faith, they represent the same human response to God. So one is converted, receives Christ, and comes to him when he repents and believes. The Bible employs a variety of other terms for coming to Christ or receiving Christ, such as taking the water of life, Revelation 21 and verse 6, looking to the Savior, Isaiah 45, 22, eating the living bread from heaven, the Lord Jesus, John 6, 51, pressing into God's kingdom, Luke 16, 16, entering the flock of Christ through Christ is the door, John 10, 9, and uh, there are others as well that the Bible employs. There are certain other ideas that people who often mean well equate with receiving the gospel, such as asking Jesus into your heart, being baptized, going forward at the invitation in a church service or a revival meeting, receiving the laying on of hands, taking communion, praying the sinner's prayer to accept Christ, having unique emotional experiences, coming to the altar, seeing visions, signing a decision card, speaking in tongues, and many other things of that kind. None of those things are said to be the way that you receive forgiveness in the Bible. So in our study, we're going to stick to what God's Word says on this subject rather than utilizing humanly originated ideas, which can often cause soul-threatening confusion on this all-important matter.
So at the same moment at which one repents and believes, he is born again, according to John chapter 3 and verses 3 and 5, where Christ says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And verse 5 says the same thing. Uh, being born again is the same thing as what Titus 3 and verse 5 calls regeneration. God saves us by his mercy through the washing of Christ's blood in regeneration, being born again and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So being born again or re regeneration refer to a radical, permanent, and life-altering change God performs upon the one who comes to Christ. In the words of 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, which is what happens when he's born again and regenerated, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So at that moment, when one in repentance believes the gospel and is regenerated, adoption and justification take place, along with positional sanctification. One is now in Christ. Practical sanctification also becomes a certainty because uh, at the moment of the new birth, one is given a new inward principle of holiness, a new heart, according to Hebrews 8 and verse 10, to replace the old depraved heart that we have before we're born again, according to Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, with a consequent transformation of one's inward desires and actions. So the new child of God, characteristically, according to Matthew 12 and verse 35, uh, brings forth good things out of the good treasure of his heart rather than the evil things which came forth from the evil treasure of his old sinful nature. Ultimate glorification also becomes a certainty. For John 4.14, Christ guarantees that whoever drinks of the spiritual water that he gives shall never thirst. That's a guarantee. But the water that Christ gives shall be in him, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So it is a certain thing that those that partake of Christ spiritually by repentant faith and are born again will never perish. Now a person repents and believes and is born again at a specific moment in time. So Christ says in John 5, 24, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Present tense has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So at that very moment that somebody believes on Christ, he goes from a state of spiritual death to a state of spiritual life. He goes from being a child of the devil to being a child of God. He goes from being lost to being saved. He goes from being unforgiven to being forgiven, from being condemned to being justified, from being headed to hell to heading to heaven. So there's no in-between stage where a person is half God's child and half the devil's child, somewhat headed to heaven and somewhat headed to hell, somewhat in Christ, somewhat not. No, it's, it's you're either on one side or the other here. So the new birth is not a process that takes place over weeks or over months or over years, but it's the, a work of an instant that the Holy Spirit performs in the life of somebody whom he saves. It is the most important event in the life of God's people. And all who never experience the new birth will be eternally lost. Because Christ says, without being born again, you will not inherit the kingdom of God, John 3, 3 and 5. So, in light of the conscious workings of the mind and will, which we're going to see are associated with repentance and faith, and in light of the radical transformation involved in being born again or being regenerated, uh, you would expect that one who's been born again will know when that change took place. How could someone repent and be given a new heart or new nature and pass from being God's enemy to being God's dear child and receive all the other effects of salvation without knowing about it? Now, we're not talking about exceptional situations where you know, a person has dementia and can't remember things or stuff like that. But certainly in the vast majority of ordinary situations, someone who has been born again will know when it took place. So if you cannot identify the point in your life when you were born again, you're in extreme danger of having never had this glorious transformation take place and of still being dead in your sins. Now, repentance and faith are simultaneous. Simultaneous. 
One cannot savingly repent without believing the gospel, and you can't believe in Christ without repenting. They're like two sides of the same coin, heads and tails. You can't have the front of a quarter without having the back as well. And no one can have uh, either repentance or faith without also having the other. There are no truly repentant unbelievers, and there are no unrepentant true believers. Since repentance and faith involve each other, Scripture often states eternal life is conditioned only upon faith or only upon repentance. So, for example, in John 3.18, the Bible says, He that believeth on him, on Christ, is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And likewise, you can see texts that condition eternal life only on uh, uh, repentance, just like here, only faith is mentioned. So like in Acts 11:18, 18, it talks about repentance unto life. So when you repent, you get life. Uh, and in Luke 13 and verse 3, it's uh, Christ said, unless you accept you repent, you shall all likewise perish. So if you don't repent, you perish. If you repent, you have life. If you don't believe, you are condemned. If you believe, you are not condemned. So both repentance and faith express the single act of receiving or coming to Christ but they do emphasize different aspects of that decision. So what we're going to look at in Bible study five here is what repentance is and what it is not, and what faith is and what it is not. So those are the four parts of study number five. And we're gonna go in the order of, first we're gonna look at what repentance is not and then what it is. Then we're gonna look at what faith is not and what faith is, those are the four parts. And through that we'll gain a clear understanding of what this conversion, what this receiving of the gospel is that God requires of all people. And nothing could be more important for you because without genuine repentance and faith, the benefits of Christ's work on the cross are unobtainable. And without Christ as your Savior, you'll certainly suffer the unbearable wrath of God to all eternity. So we need to understand what repentance and faith is. This is absolutely crucial. So we're going to start off here with saving repentance, what it is not. What falls short of saving repentance. Now many people never truly repent because they are content with imitations of repentance that fall short of it. And that's something that Satan wants. Uh, here in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Satan's called the lowercase g God of this world. And it says that he hath blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So Satan wants people confused about who Christ is and about how to receive the gospel. And substitutes for genuine repentance may pacify people's conscience right now, and it may convince other people that they've repented and are Christians, but they won't do any good in the day when you stand before God. Then all who have not repented will perish, as Christ warned. Now, we cannot look at every possible kind of false repentance, but we're going to look at a number of common ones. So first, we're going to see here that taking up the profession of Christianity is not the same thing as repentance. It falls short of repentance. So Titus 1 and verse 16 says they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. So we can see here that there's people here who are uh, claim to be Christians, profess to be Christians, but God calls them abominable, and that is loathsome or abhorrent, and he rejects them. So simply claiming to be a Christian doesn't mean you are a Christian, doesn't mean you've genuinely repented. In Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Christ gives a very stern warning. He says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So here, the Lord Jesus warns us that many will be rejected, not just those who know nothing of Jesus Christ. And Acts 4.12 says there's no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. So we have to know who Jesus is to be saved. But here, many people who say to him, Lord, Lord, will be rejected. Not simply those who profess him, uh, with, uh, but even here, many preachers, many prophets, many miracle workers, many zealous doers of good works in Christ's name, will be damned. 
These are not people who were at one point justified and then somehow became unsaved and became unjustified. That's impossible according to Scripture. But these are people who were never saved. Christ says to them, I never knew you, not I knew you and then I stopped knowing you. So certainly it is a good thing to profess Christ, and one who is truly repented will certainly confess Christ. He'll certainly profess Christ and he'll say, I'm a Christian. But simply professing Christ is not enough. And one may claim Christianity without being a Christian. Do you not even profess to be a Christian? Well, woe to you. If you profess to be one, have you actually repented? Your claim alone will not save you from hell. Have you repented or do you simply say you are a Christian? So taking up the profession of Christianity is not repentance. Secondly, receiving baptism is not repentance. A person may be baptized without having repented. There's a sorcerer mentioned in Acts 8, chapter, verses 9 through 11, named Simon, who was amazed at the power of the true God. He claimed to have become a Christian and convinced Philip the evangelist to baptize him in Acts chapter 8, and verse 13. He not only deceived Philip, but likely was self-deceived. He probably thought he had indeed been converted, although he had not been. In this, he's like many people today who think they are converted, but are not. Later, Simon showed that he was never saved by trying to buy the miraculous power the apostles had in Acts chapter 8, verses 18 and 19. The apostle Peter rejected his request and said the following in Acts 20, 8, 20, verses, uh, 8, verses 20 and 23. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God had been purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness, and in the bond of iniquity. So if even apostolic preachers baptized people who had not truly repented, we should expect that multitudes today have been baptized who are unrepentant. On the other hand, there was a thief who was crucified with Christ on the cross next to him who genuinely repented. And we can see, even though he never got baptized, Christ said that he would be with him in paradise. So here in Luke chapter 23, there were two thieves, one on either of Christ's side, and the one thief uh, here uh, came to his senses. And it says uh, that that thief rebuked the other one, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So here we have an example of a person who died and never was baptized, but was in paradise that very day. So Simon the sorcerer was baptized, but was unrepentant and unforgiven. But this thief was repentant and forgiven, although unbaptized. There are some groups who claim uh, to be Christians, but believe a false gospel, that baptism is required for salvation. That's not true. It's a false gospel. Uh, there's an, I have an in-depth refutation of that idea in the book Heaven Only for the Baptized, the Gospel of Christ versus Pardon through Baptism, which is, can be found at faithsaves.net. Uh, you could purchase a copy at online bookstores as well. But uh, we can see here that baptism is not the same thing as the new birth. So how is it with you? Baptized or unbaptized, you're still dead in your sins unless you've genuinely repented. So baptism is, is something good. You should be baptized if you have repented. But baptism is not the same thing as having repented. We can also see that possessing mere moral righteousness or externally being conformed to the rules of piety is not repentance. Simply being moral or externally conformed, outwardly conforming to right things is not repentance. So here in Luke chapter 18, verses 11 and 12, there was a moral person here, a Pharisee, uh, was a religious sect back then. They were very uh, moral and upright and things. It says the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Verse 12, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. So here was this Pharisee who was a very moral person. He was just in his dealings with others. 
He abstained from sexual immorality. He performed many religious duties. But Christ said in Luke 18 and verse 14 that he was still lost. He did not go down to his house justified like the tax collector who truly repented in verse 18 and verse 13. So 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22 says, One may escape the pollutions of the world through knowing truth about Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 3, 5 says one can have a form of godliness. Matthew 23, 14 shows somebody can pray long. Luke 18, 12 shows that somebody can fast often. Mark 6, 20 shows somebody can hear the word of God gladly. And Isaiah 1, 11 shows someone can be zealous for the service and worship of God, although costly and expensive, and still be lost, having never repented. The repentant man is a moral person, as the Christian man is a human being, but one can be moral and not repentant, just as one can be human but not be Christian. If you are moral and pious but not converted, you will certainly be damned. And if you're not even moral and pious, how terrible is your coming judgment? So we can see that simply possessing mere moral righteousness or externally being conformed to the rules of piety is not repentance. Having powerful or even miraculous spiritual experiences is also not repentance. You can have tremendous spiritual encounters and participate in amazing miraculous events, such as speaking in tongues or seeing visions or experiencing healings, and still be eternally damned. Christ warned not to seek those things. In Matthew 12, verse 39, he says, An evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And he said, there shall no sign be given to it, but the, his resurrection, which he calls the sign of the prophet Jonah in context there. So an evil and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign. So even if you could know that his spiritual experience was from God and not from, from demons or the devil, because they can work miracles too, according to Revelation 16 and verse 14, it would be no proof that you're born again. So for example, in Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19, the Lord Jesus healed 10 lepers on a trip to Jerusalem. And, but only one of the ten actually placed his faith in Christ and was spiritually saved. The other nine were still lost. All ten, perfectly healed, but to one he said, Thy faith hath saved thee. One of the twelve apostles, Judas, was actually not born again, never converted. Uh, and he was one of the apostles to fulfill a prophecy that, that one of the apostles would betray him. But God gave the unconverted apostle of Judas power to do miracles like the other apostles in Matthew 10, 4, 5, and 8. Wow. There was a high priest named Caiaphas, the high priest who had a special position in, in the kingdom of Israel, in Israel. And he plotted against the Lord Jesus. In, in uh, John eleven forty nine 49 through 52, in 1814, he actually spoke a true prophecy from God. And God in Numbers 22, 28 to 30, and 2 Peter 2, 16, even made a donkey miraculously speak his word. So, uh, if you have seen a miracle, or performed a miracle, or something amazing happened to you, that doesn't make you any more born again than it made the donkey born again, that God made speak. Or then the wicked high priest Caiaphas, who plotted against Jesus for him to be killed, uh, was born again because he made a prophecy. Or Judas was born again because he did miracles. Or those lepers were born again because they were healed. In Luke chapter 16, 29 through 31, it says that even if one went at you from the dead, some dead person came out of hell and warned you, you saw this, this dead person, well, that would be an incredible miracle. But in Luke 16, 29 to 31, it says that you would still perish unless you repented, even if you saw such an amazing miracle. In John chapter 9, we actually have the example of a man who had an astonishing miracle of healing done in his life by Jesus Christ. On that account, he wanted to be Jesus' disciple. He even suffered persecution for the sake of the Lord Jesus in John chapter 9. But if you read chapter 9, verses 1 through 34, he was still lost. Not until after all of that, he finally repented and believed the gospel, as recorded in John 9, 35 to 41, was he born again. So here's somebody who's suffering persecution, wants to be Jesus' disciple, and still is lost until he finally repents and believes. There were multitudes of people who saw the Son of God during his ministry on earth, but never received the gospel. There were multitudes who he healed, but never repented. And people who are standing before Christ at his great white throne of judgment, and before he cast them into the lake of fire, they'll have an, 
amazing vision of Jesus Christ, better than anything anybody says he has who says, oh, I saw this vision of Jesus. Well, that's going to be much more amazing. But simply having that vision of Jesus at the great white throne, the, the real thing, they're still going to go to the lake of fire. So many people today think that they're born again because they've had some kind of spiritual experience or the experience is supernatural. Very often such experiences are from Satan, but even if they were from God directly and you could prove that, they would still not mean that your sins are forgiven. So we can see that having powerful or even miraculous spiritual experiences is not repentance. Chaining up or reforming inward corruption, that inward sinful heart, by education or human laws or the force of affliction, is also not repentance. In 2 Chronicles chapter 24, we have the record of a king named Joash who appeared to be a good man. It says in 2 Chronicles 24 and verse 2 that Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. So Jehoiada the priest was Joash's mentor. Jehoiada guided Joash in the ways of righteousness from his youth. Jehoiada educated him. Jehoiada appointed him to worship and to follow Jehovah. And as long as Jehoiada was around, Joash did the right things. He had, uh, Jehoiada had trained the king so well that Joash even initiated a project to repair the house of the Lord. In 2 Chronicles 24 and verse 4, and that's very good. So Joash certainly did not think of himself as somebody who was just waiting to do evil. He was just you know, hoping to get out of this, uh, what Jehoiada was doing. But he had a good, well-trained conscience and a, and a good education, a cr- tremendous privilege here. But look at what happened after Jehoiada died in 2 Chronicles 24, 15 to 22. But Jehoiada waxed old and was full of days when he died. And 134 and years old was he when he died. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel both toward God and toward his house. Now, after the death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah and made obeisance to the king. They bowed to him. Then the king hearkened unto them. Now he's listening to the princes instead of to Jehoiada. And they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols. And the wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this their trespass. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again to the Lord. And they testified against them, but they would not give ear. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, which stood above the people and said unto them, Thus saith God, Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord that ye cannot prosper? Because ye have forsaken the Lord, he hath also forsaken you. And they conspired against him and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. Thus Joash the king remembered not the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but slew his son. Wow. (laughs) So here, once Jehoiada was gone, Joash turned away from the Lord to worship false gods. And when Jehoiada's own son preached to him and reproved him for his sin, Joash had him murdered in the very courts of God's temple. So we can see that a good upbringing or laws that enforce godly behavior or well-trained conscience may lead you to act in a righteous way, but you may still be without that supernatural change of nature that comes with the new birth. Outward restraints may suppress the expression of the wickedness of your heart so that that wickedness is smoldering, hardly to be noticed, but once the restraints against evil are removed, your depravity will flare up as an all-consuming fire. Your sin was never rooted out. It was just hidden. As with education and human laws, times of distress and affliction may lead a person to seek God and yet not repent. So in Psalm 78, 34 through 37, it talks about a time when uh, in Israel there was judgment. And it says that when God slew them, then they sought him. And they returned and inquired early after God. And they remember that he was the rock and all this kind of stuff. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth. They lied unto him with their tongues. For their heart was not right with him. Neither were they steadfast in his covenant. So we can see here that they had their trouble made them seek after God in a certain way, but that doesn't mean that they genuinely repented. So your inward wickedness may be restrained by education or by laws or by affliction, 
But if you haven't repented, you'll still be eternally damned. The new birth doesn't simply curb the manifestations of your sinful heart, Jeremiah 17, 9, but it gives you a new heart, Hebrews 8 and verse 10. Likewise, illumination of spiritual need from the Holy Spirit or conviction of sin from the Holy Spirit alone are not repentance. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 and following, talk about people who were enlightened, they tasted of the heavenly gift, and they were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. They were people who had partook of his ministry of convicting them of sin. The Holy Spirit showed them that their sinful nature and their wickedness. But what happens to these people? Nevertheless, in verse 6, we can see that they never repented. And in verse 8, their end is cursing and it's to be burned like a fire. There was a wicked ruler named Felix who the Apostle Paul preached to in Acts 24 and verse 25. And as Paul reasoned of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. So God showed this pagan Roman Felix his need for Christ, and he trembled in recognition of the truth. But instead of repenting, he told Paul to go for this time, putting off receiving the gospel. He seems to have put it off the rest of his life and therefore burns in hell today. King Herod heard the godly preacher John the Baptist gladly in Mark 6 and verse 20. He knew that John the Baptist was a just man, a holy man, and when he heard him preach, he did many things and heard him gladly. So here, the wicked King Herod liked to hear John the Baptist preach and gladly heard him. Wow. But Herod never received the gospel. He later beheaded John, in, uh, just a few verses later in Mark chapter 6. And Herod was involved in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 23 with Pilate. So some hearts, when they're broken by the Holy Spirit, working through the preached word, were brought to repentance in Acts 2, 37, 38, and 41. But others in Acts 5 and verse 33 and 7, 54, when they were cut to the heart by the Holy Spirit, they took counsel to slay the preachers instead. So God may have been at work in your life, enabling you to see your great need of the gospel, and perhaps you even responded to that conviction in some way. But unless you repented and believed the gospel, you are still lost. So illumination of spiritual need by the Holy Spirit or conviction of sin alone are not repentance. Partial surrender or making negoti trying to make conditions with God is also not repentance. When Israel was coming out of the land of Egypt, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, gave in partially and he tried to make negotiate with God, try to cut a deal with God when God was sending the plagues to deliver Israel from Egypt under the hand of Moses. So in Exodus 7 and verse 3, his heart was hardened and not broken by the work of God. When he was in distress from the plagues, he actually promised to submit to God in Exodus 8 and verse 8, but he never actually did. When the reasons for his fear and affliction were gone, he returned to disobedience and hardened his heart all the more, as Exodus 8 and verse 15 and Exodus 9 and verse 34 show. So the Lord had said that all the Israelites needed to leave, but Pharaoh tried to cut a deal with God. He said after these successive plagues and judgments, he said, well, I'm going to allow Israel to worship Jehovah in the land of Egypt. They can't go, just, just stay here. Or he says, well, you can go, but don't go very far away. So he says that in Acts, Exodus 8, 25 through 28, trying to cut a deal with God. Maybe you can go, just don't go too far, or, you know, uh, stay in the land, something like that. Or then later, he said, when that didn't work, he tried to cut another deal with God. He said, well, the men can go, Exodus 10, 10, 11, but you have to leave your women and, and the little children. So, yeah, they can go. Uh, or later, there was another plague, because God didn't like that, it doesn't, you don't cut deals with God, okay? And so, in Exodus 20, 10, 24 to 28, he said, well, uh, all the people can go, but leave your flocks and your herds. They can't go. No, they can't go. So he tried to cut another deal with God, and that also didn't work. Other times he tried things like saying, uh, not admitting his total sinfulness. He would say things like, uh, well, uh, 
oh, I have sinned this time, but not I'm depraved and I'm wicked. Just, I sinned this time. Okay? To say, to say things like that. He would have completely humbled himself before God, according to Exodus 10 and verse 3. And because he would not completely give in to God, he brought himself upon himself total disaster. His firstborn son was slain in Exodus 12, 29 to 33. His land was destroyed in Exodus 10, 7. His army was drowned in the Red Sea, according to Exodus 14, 21 to 30. And his soul was eternally lost. So you can't cut deals with God. You can't only partially give in to God so that you hold on to certain sins. You have to completely agree. You not partially agree with what he says about your wickedness and sinful nature. God will receive you. Repentance involves coming to God in his own terms, which is unconditional surrender. So when you repent, you don't cut any deal. You agree with God. He's right, you're wrong. You unconditionally surrender to him. So partial surrender or um, things like that fall short of genuine repentance. Don't be like Pharaoh. We can also see that sorrow only over the results of sin is not repentance. In the book of Hebrews 12, 16, and 17, we see Esau, who is called a profane person, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. And afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected by God, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. What is this, what is this referring to? Well, Esau was the firstborn of Abraham's son Isaac. And Esau, as the firstborn son, possessed a birthright that promised him tremendous blessings and privileges that God had given to his grandfather Abraham. So Esau was in a position to be the father of the chosen nation and to be the one through whom the Messiah, the one through whom the Lord Jesus Christ would be born. But one day after returning from hunting, Esau was hungry and he sold his birthright to his brother Jacob for a bowl of soup. <laughs> wow, birthright, bowl of soup. Hmm. Well, he thought the bowl of soup was better. So in an act of almost incomprehensible uh, sin and foolishness, Esau despised his birthright in Genesis 29, 25, 29 through 34. He sold his birthright to Jacob for some soup. And later, when he realized what he had done in Genesis 27, 34 to 38, he cried with a great and exceedingly bitter cry. And he lifted up his voice and he wept. So he hated the consequences of his sin, but he, you know, losing the birthright, losing the Abrahamic covenant, and it was a bad situation. Uh, it was the ex most expensive bowl of soup he ever had. So while he hated the consequences of his sin, he never repented. Instead of admitting that he had awfully sinned and despising the birthright that God had given him, he blamed Jacob for his loss. He said it was Jacob's fault in verse 36 here. He selfishly thought about only what he would not gain, not about his crimes against God. In verses 34, 36, and 38, if you count them, he says, me or my, 11 times in just those three verses. And instead of submitting to God in his will, in verse 41, he determined that he was going to kill his brother Jacob, and which would have, have destroyed the, the promised line now. So that's how much he cared about the promised line. He's going to kill his brother. So 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10 talks about, contrasts a godly sorrow, which worketh repentance to salvation, with a sorrow of the world, a worldly sorrow, which worketh death. So there are many people today who are like Esau. They've sold their souls, they've sold eternity in God's presence for the perishing things of this world which is folly like that Esau committed in trading his birthright in the coming Messiah for some soup. Many have also seen the bad results of their sins. They've hated those results. They took drugs or they got drunk and they hated the consequences of their destroyed bodies, their destroyed families, their destroyed relationships, their destroyed life. Many have been sexually immoral and they hated the disease, the loss of purity, the hosts of other evil consequences. They've stolen, or they've cheated, or they've lied, and they hated the penalties when they were caught. But they didn't hate 
their sin for its own sake as contrary to the holy and pure and good and loving God. Many people hate hell and they find the concept of eternal torment for their sins an awful and unbearable consequence. They may feel great anguish, great uh, sorrow over the punishment God decreed for their sins and they may shed streams of tears over that but they would keep their sin and have heaven too if they could. Now it's right to hate the consequences of sin, but it is not enough. You may have a worldly sorrow that regrets, regrets the damage sin causes and the terrible results of sin without hating sin itself, without wanting God for who he is, and without ever repenting. So only being sorry for the results or consequences of sin is not enough you will still be eternally damned unless you repent. So beware that you are not content with any of these satanic alternatives to genuine repentance. If you are, you will be lost. Not only will these not save, but other false hopes, such as your sincerity, God's apparent answers to your prayers, experiences of peace and joy, someone else telling you that you are saved, a powerful decision about salvation you made in a church service, saying the words of a sinner's prayer, things like that will not save you. You need to reject any false repentance and all other false hopes and take heed to the solemn warning of the Lord Jesus Christ, except ye repent, you shall all likewise perish.